write all this stuff in here. I'm just, I'm just going to turn your volume down. <laughs> it's just, it's just safer. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's just safe for everybody. Good morning. I'm just literally turned Officer Goodwin's volume down because I find it safer before we go live. Because he I can speak a lot louder. Yeah. <laughs> let me bring let me bring you up, Officer Goodwin. There we go. You can't get rid of me just like that, buddy. Tell me. Did I bring up the right microphone? I think I did. Go again. I said you can't get rid of me just like by turning me volume off with me. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, perfect. Good morning, everybody. We're just bringing all of our technical know-how together and just making sure that everything is as it should be and we can see everything. So just bring up all the comments. So I'm sure you can hear us. I've not done a sound test this morning. So if somebody could just let me know that they can hear us, okay, that would be really useful and helpful. Um, and we will get started because today, Officer Goodwin, we are going into education, aren't we? Education, yes, absolutely all the various forms of it and the, the way it used to be and probably the way it is today. Uh, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just waiting for my internet to catch me up today. It's just running a little bit slow. So I'm just going to make sure that I'm running. I'm going to have to change internet provider. Oh no. Okay. Just bear with me. Hopefully we won't get a little blip. We may do, but it should be, it should come through. Okay. That's what happens to the officer Goodwin when I don't do a text tech check know, beforehand. Part of the 5P planning. Yeah, good. Right, everyone can hear us loud and clear. Officer Goodwin, should we just, should we just crack straight into it? Do you want me to talk any more or do, should I just be quiet? Well, maybe if I could ever stop you, I would ask you to. So you, <laughs> you carry on as normal. Okay, do you know what? Let's, let's step back. Um, let, let's, let's step back to when, when you were in the prison service. Let's talk about education for prisons. That one might be a little bit big. There we go. It's all yeah, yours, Officer G. Education in prisons, guys. Uh, yeah, it, um, it's been around a long, long time. I think there's a bit of a notion that perhaps they didn't have education in prisons. And if you go back far enough, probably to the 1800s, they had a different version of education that we might understand today. Much of it would have been sort of religious based. Uh, we do know from Shrewsbury's history that prisoners, when they were in their cells, single cells, silent regime running, uh, the only book that they would be permitted to read or given to read would be the Holy Bible. Um, so it was more of a religious education rather than what they call an academic education. Remember, in the 1800s, there was no such thing as compulsory school education for children uh, anyway, or, or and particularly they were leaving school at 12 and going to work. Uh, without any sort of formal education. Uh, I joined in 1977, obviously the world had changed right the way through the 30s, 40s and 50s. They recognized that many prisoners were coming into a prison system that would probably have not had the academic qualifications or a very poor, if not missing education altogether. So they started off with the things like the, the, the classic things that we still do today, reading and writing. There are many prisoners that come into jail that are what they call at remedial levels. For whatever reason that they haven't achieved that, it may be that they've had a very disruptive young life in school with not a great deal of constant education. It may have been in the secondary school, they might have just dipped out of school for whatever different reasons there are and missed out on that very important part of their educational life, particularly in secondary school where you're looking at now your GCSEs and your A-levels, which are fundamental today in any job that you're going to apply for. Um, there isn't an application form in the world, or certainly in this country, that doesn't ask you your school attainments right the way through from when you were in school and what was your minimum qualifications and what are your qualifications now and such like. Uh, and that's just about for every job. Sometimes those qualifications aren't all that necessary, but education in its own right is always a good thing. Can I, can I just jump in there very, yeah, absolutely. very, very quickly? Because you know me, I like to ask questions because you're absolutely right that, that every single job still nowadays people ask for a minimum of like four GCSEs for example yep. and, and, and so on and so forth and that's that's kind of the minimum required as well to get to the next level of learning um, but in, in your experience and, and throughout the time that you've worked in prisons would you say it was it was regular or you had a number of prisoners or could you put a figure on how many prisoners you would have seen that couldn't read or write like literally read or write at all. Uh, it, it, it's really difficult because not being involved in the education programs themselves because they're run by uh, obviously uh, qualified teachers and such like we, we I wouldn't really have that access it's probably on the internet somewhere within the prison government websites uh, but 
Uh, yeah, I, I suspect that education prisoners are more able to do the basic education today than they might have been if you're going back to the 50s, 60s uh, and 70s. Remember, people were leaving school at 14 and 15 years old in those days. It was only relatively recently in our history that we increased it to 16. And now, indeed, it's right the way up till nearly 18 years old, where you must be either in some kind of education and or training programs yeah. uh, until you're 18. Um, when I first joined, yeah, I, I do remember going around the education shops. Um, and um, it was what it was for its time. Remember, there was no such thing as technology around in those days. So a lot of it was based around uh, reading, writing, uh, arithmetic, as they used to call it, uh, and those basics. Libraries played a hugely important part in that education program in prisons. You've got to go back to a time before the 1990s when there were no TVs in prisons at all in their cells uh, and probably limited amount of prisoners had their little battery radios. So uh, reading was really quite a... Uh, 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 a, a, a sort of prolific many prisoners and it wouldn't be unusual to find them having two or three or four books in a cell because they were in cells a lot longer then than they are today so it was about um, probably killing time for them but accidentally uh, any book that you read has got to be educational any book that's got yeah. to improve your ability to read words and understand context uh, even though some of those books were based on and the most popular books in prison were on the craze <laughs> and charlie bronson yeah. um, but yeah. either way you're reading the book it's about being developing those skills to look and look at context and decide what you think is accurate and not how to escape a prison 101 yeah. <laughs> now when i first joined the service the books were nearly always donated in actual fact, the library, when it came time, the local libraries, when it came time to get rid of their old stock, we would look for those donations for them to come into prison. And, and very often, uh, we'd, we'd all bring our own books in, paperback books that we read, and just donate them into the library for prisoners to get access to. Uh, and there was a time when books were allowed to be brought into a prison on visits by families, of course. So they were allowed to bring those books uh, in as well, which they did sometimes two and three and four at a time. I assume that got stopped based on some of the conversation we had previously about about visits and about contraband, about drugs, because yeah, people could, all about, could, could potentially yeah. dip pages and then prisoners yeah. could obviously sell pages, roll yeah, pages. They, they work pages. on the philosophy, sort of nothing comes in, nothing goes out, yeah. uh, stuff like that. So all that stuff. Uh, and then, um, <clears throat> then later on, uh, probably in the mid to late 90s, particularly in Shrewsbury and possibly across the country, they decided they need to expand that education and not rely on charity with some of those books perhaps weren't up to the standard you'd like them to be. So they literally linked up with the local um, libraries service. Uh, so when prisoners come to Shrewsbury Prison, and I'm sure it's true of all prisons, they could then sign on to the Shrewsbury Library and actually order books that weren't available in our current library, even though we had a good stock. You can see behind you there, that's not Shrewsbury. There's a reasonable stock of books mm. in the library. Um, so they could actually order a book, and if it was available in the, in, in the library, that would be brought in. It might take a week or two to get hold of it. And they took those books under the same conditions that anyone out in the local community took their books out of the library. They signed on, they could keep the books up to three books, they could keep them for uh, three weeks, I think it was, or something like that. And if they lost the book or damaged it, they'd pay the fine that was there um, for damage in the book. Uh, and it was very rarely abused, I must be honest. Very, very rarely did that sort of go wrong. So it was respected and valued by the prisoners. Um, many other books, people just think it's not about just reading novels and other factual books. Uh, the prison libraries also hold legal books. So they actually hold literally books that talk about the law. They get exactly the same ones that you see barristers flick through when they're running trials precedence in law, the actual rules, the regulations, and those books are enormous books. They're very, very expensive, so prisoners can't just come and borrow that book and take it back to their cell, or at least not in, in, at Shrewsbury. They were entitled to sit in the library and read through that book and take excerpts from it if they needed, uh, because they may be um, going to an appeal, or they may be still remand prisoners, innocent or proving, preparing uh, some evidence for their defence and looking at the legalities of that. So would those you, books are available for prisoners as well. Would you find a lot of prisoners would do that? Would they would they get involved in their cases in the sense of to, to the legal aspects? Would they leave that to solicitors? Or uh, I guess that kind of depends. It, it depends it. a great deal, doesn't it? I suppose if you have to be honest about it, these books are extremely difficult books to read. Yeah. I've had to flick through them myself because they've got all the parts they are of in the fourth. Le legal language is another language. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Language, it is. Yeah. It's, you're easier learning Latin than you yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the reality is with that is, yeah, so prisoners that were pulling those books would have been able to have that ability to read and at least partially understand what they were reading. Many prisoners member come to prison. They're really quite, they're highly intelligent, yeah. well-educated. So basically they may be looking at their own defense. 
They may decide that the solicitors and the barristers are not for them for whatever reason, they can't afford it, or there's no uh, um, sort of government substance for it, and they'll just represent themselves. Um, so, yeah, so, the, so that's the oh, library that's, is the very that, start of that sort of thing. Sorry, I'm going I'm to have to jump in there. Represent themselves. There's a saying, isn't there? It's um, uh, somebody who represents themselves has a clown for a client <laughs> Apparently or, or, or so, something yeah. like that. Yeah. But it's, um, it, that, that must be a difficult... It, that, so we're going we're gonna to go off, off, off kilter here, I know, but did you know any prisoners or can you remember any prisoners in your time that would have represented themselves in courts, almost fired yes. their own solicitors? Uh, a themselves? few and far between, uh, but one of the problems did, did you find out? when you represent <laughs> yeah. yourself, your emotions can get in the exactly, way. Yeah. And, and there are very strict laws about how you question your witnesses yeah. and how you question uh, other people in the court, uh, because there's laws about you can't just it, there's a, it's, it's a fine art. I've got to be honest, being a yeah. barrister, a good barrister is a fine art. Um, so there may be prisoners there that may come into trouble because the judge is having to pull them up all the time yeah. because they go, you can't say that in law, you can't do that or yeah. that. So you can see, but not all, there might be one or two that are very good, but it's difficult when you're representing yourself for extremely serious charges that you don't allow your version and the emotions to slip into it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've seen one or two that have done a very, very good job and others uh, you've gone, you, you need to stop now and get yourself a solicitor or a barrister. And I think that's really interesting yeah. because because we, we say the word solicitor or legal defence and we think, oh, the solicitor is the person that, that will be the be all and end all. And actually, that's not the case. And no. I've, I've, I've been in court a number of times, never never, never through wrongdoing, can I point out, no, for, no, for no, different no, legal issues, says, for, for, says, for, yeah. for, for business issues. But it's certainly it's it's the lawyers and the solicitors will deal with it to a point. And then you bring in a barrister who's the person that actually stands in front of the judge or in front of the jury. Yeah in front of the court and does the case. Yeah, the the it, barrister is the advocate. Set. Yes, this. He argues the information that he's given by the solicitor very often because the solicitor does all the legwork. Yeah. They work in the background, pulling yeah. up all the evidence, the witnesses. Uh, you'll very often see in court cases where you'll see somebody sliding a note to a barrister yeah. in front of them. And that will be the solicitor sitting behind there normally about questions and points of law and little things like that. But anyway. Uh, I, I think you would have made a great barrister, Mr. Goodwin. Can yeah, I just yeah. say, I, th I think you'd have been a fantastic barrister. Never fail. <laughs> just keep talking. That's the, just keep talking. Until the judge goes, let him go. I'm tired of all this. You've missed your calling. <laughs> but uh, no, so, so we move on. So, so libraries, we're, we're, we're vastly and still are vastly important within prison education. Um, obviously, you've got all kinds of stuff. You've got remedial that goes on in prisons, and there are some prisons that come in that struggle to read and write. Uh, and, and one of the problems they also have is they may struggle to sit in a classroom in a formal session like we used to in school. So for whatever reason, they struggle in a classroom setting. When you get into your 20s and you're still struggling to read and write, there may be a case where they don't have the confidence anymore or they don't want other people to realize that they don't have the confidence they can't read and write so they brought out a scheme many years ago and it was called the one-to-one -one scheme it goes on outside but in in the in, in in the prison system it's basically a mentoring scheme and what we do is we identify prisoners that have got a good education can read well uh, and, and, and do those particularly reading more than mathematics um, but can read well uh, and we encourage them and they do it as a part of a paid job and what they will do is become a mentor on a one-to-one -one basis to teach prisoners to improve their skills at reading and, and writing as well. And rather than sit in a classroom setting, they may do that on the wing, they may do that in a little room somewhere away from education where that can be done. And that prisoner grows in confidence then and learning to read and write without having to sit in that formal education classroom, which may have all kinds of other distractions going on. And it is a very, very successful thing. Um, you know, so, the, so this idea that memory, prisoners do many things in prison that may be of a benefit to a prisoner, but I don't want to talk about the other things because it's not based on education. Can, can I just ask very quickly, well, well, Polly actually has asked, um, who's watching us down uh, from, from Shepton Mallet Prison, so Polly, Polly's watching down there, and she's asked, what were the most popular types of books requested by prisoners? Oh, no, the craze. Uh, so it was, Charlie Bronson. Yeah. <laughs> they were the books that were on the longest waiting list. Not all prisoners, of course, but uh, th th there was no any particular popular book. Some prisoners liked the factual books. Some prisoners liked books with them um, with lots of art in it. Yeah. Uh, so they and they would they would be in their cells, and some of them turned out to be perfectly very very good artists. So they'd have pictures of birds or people and start practicing their drawing skills, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and novels, obviously, loads and loads of different novels. Uh, yeah, anything that you can find in the library, you can find in a prison library. Be honest with you. There are one or two things that may be excluded, but they're usually excluded in public libraries as well. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, no. Uh, but uh, we do know that Charlie, Charlie Bronson and the craze about their life 
was the most popular requested book in prisons. And I'm sure that's true of all prisons. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think we'll actually run a session. We'll, we'll do an actual live just specific on some really high profiled infamous prisoners yes. over time. And, and, yeah. and those three will probably be, be the three that we sort of focus on because there's a huge piece from, from our perspective is, is running heritage attractions and the dark tourism side about how they, that, that, that type of person or those people are glamorized Whereas others are vilified, yeah. and 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 the reasons why? Because yeah. you know they. Yeah. Why are they in the media and times. others aren't? And sometimes yeah. you might say it's because the media put them there rather than their own their own um, uh, volition to get into the media. But now, 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 just just before we move off libraries, because I know we're obviously talking about education, but we're, we're on library specific at the moment. From a religious perspective, I, I assume, having never worked in a prison or been in a prison as a prisoner, that there would have been uh, they would have obviously had access to different religious texts and different religious books. Yes. Now, would this been similar to? And this is going to sound crazy, I know, but would this have been like similar to a hotel where you have a Bible in every room? Uh, no, they, they do say way back in time that there would be a Victorian Bible in times. every cell. Yeah, yeah, Victorian uh, times. And I think it was the James Bible. Yeah. I think it's the James Bible, isn't James, it? Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in hotels. Uh, and I believe, I don't think they do that anymore for obviously because there's really such know. a diversity of religions yeah. in this country. Um, but no, there is, there, when I say religious education, it isn't, doesn't happen under the religious education, under the education guide. They'll be able to go because all religions are, are basically catered for in prison yeah. and they'll have their own meetings and their own services. So their education for religion will come through the, the chaplaincy rather than through education services um but um yeah so they're sort of moving on so the remedials there but there are prisoners that come in that are quite capable of reading and writing and uh, and bright enough wherever they've missed out at their academic levels so there are opportunities in prisoners for achieve their, their gcse's uh, levels so there are opportunities for prisoners to actually achieve a levels and it's been known that some prisoners uh, particularly if they're perhaps serving a relatively longer time have achieved degrees while they've been in prison as well um so and, and the thing, the picture that you see there more, uh, it obviously, uh, IT. IT has been around for quite a while now, uh, and, 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 and there are sort of many prisoners that come in that may not be sort of uh, up to speed with their IT skills. Yeah, we can all use our mobile phones and we can all do that, but I'm talking about moving on into the IT skills of being able to use the different programs that are running there at a occupational level. Because these days there are virtually no jobs that you can do uh, where you don't need some level of IT skills. I, I, and you know, need to be in that connected world, you know. And, and I think that's fascinating because this picture has just made me think of it in the sense of there will be prisoners going to prison nowadays that obviously use mobile phones and have only ever really used mobile phones, never actually used a computer per se because Possibly. they use their phone. Yeah. And the computers in prisons, whilst they're, they're okay, yeah. they're not the most up-to-date, technologically advanced computers. Yeah. And I mean, this is an older photo you can see by the screens and stuff, but actually it's quite possible you'll get people there that won't, really know how to use computer at all because no. they're using phones. No, because they would use something that no, just iPads, literally yeah. is a finger point, uh, yeah. a press and shoot, and, and they've got, they're limited in those, whether we, phones are brilliant, they yeah. really are, I've got one, but they're limited <laughs> in what they're designed for. They're not designed like computers are to be able to running all your back software programs and, uh, and all those programs that businesses need to run. Uh, so yeah, IT skills are, are, are given there. Yeah, so as, uh, Hannah's just asked actually on education, she said, Aren't, well, she's asked, are most prisoners dyslexic or aren't most prisoners dyslex dyslexic, but are prisoners screened for things like dyslexia and educational needs before they start educational programs? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah that, that's a very good point there, because when a prisoner first comes in, they spend the first week in what they call the induction program. Um, and the idea of that is that they go around the different departments or they're seen by the different departments to assess their needs in, in them particular levels. And education will do exactly the same thing. They will come and interview a prisoner and try to find out what their academic qualifications are. I might ask them to answer a few questions just to get a gauge on where they are with that prisoner. Uh, so they'll hopefully be able to find out dyslexia and, and other issues and problems that they can address specifically. Yes, there will be a number of prisoners that come into prison uh, that will, will have a dyslexia. Uh, but remember, dyslexia comes at all different levels, Absolutely. of course. So they will address those things uh, as well. Uh, art is another thing that goes on. A lot of goes on in prison. Um, and um, I, I always put art because it's done by the education services. So art is done very well. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's, there's obviously that about being artistic. It's about planning. There's, there's, there's all kinds of theories behind how art is produced. So you don't just sit there and paint things. Somebody's going to describe the hows and why for as a how color. So it's education, uh, absolutely. 
so yeah, and, and another great program that runs in prison when it comes to things like reading and writing and when you get prisoners, even those that can read and write very well, you have sometimes um, you come into prison, what they call a, a, a writer in residence. And that means somebody's brought into the prison for say six, nine or 12 months. And they'll go down to the education department and around the prison and they're encouraging prisoners to write, sometimes about their experiences, to write about poetry. And it's about learning to express themselves uh, and um, and sometimes they put little shows on. Uh, certainly in Shrewsbury, we used to have a bit of a stage show, uh, uh, sort of sometimes close to Christmas, where prisoners could come up and recite their poems or tell a story or read something that they've written. Uh, and there are many, many prisoners that have uh, produced their own little books and their poetry books. They've been printed within the prison system and some have gone out and had them printed out. So it's up, uprating that skill that they're doing, to be honest with you, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, just interesting enough, um, education in prisons right the way up to the 1990s was always run by what they call the LEA, the local education authorities. So all the teachers that worked in you were actually employed by the local education authorities. Uh, and then they, there's ever reason to privatize it. That's not unusual. Public serve the government to come and privatize whatever they can on the belief that it's actually cheaper to run. Uh, to be efficient, but there's no evidence of that. But we won't get into the politics of that, shall we? Well, well, I, I, we yeah, I was going to say, it's, uh, uh, it happened across the prison service, didn't it? Healthcare was obviously outsourced. I mean, it recently outsourced, outsourced psych MJ. psychology. Yeah, everything's um, outsourced, yeah. So, and, yeah, it's, it's yeah. ultimately, it's somewhere along the lines, money comes into the situation, yeah. it tends to do with everything. I remember, I, I, this is an aside, I remember a time years ago, there was a, a TV programme with MPs on there, We were and they were talking specifically about prison service, prison officers, and the conditions and all that. Uh, and somebody asked the question, but when prison officers get older, particularly now you, re you don't retire till you're 68, what happens to those that they get these sort of age illnesses or they're not as physically fit as they should be, what you can do? And his reply, I think it was, um, well, I won't mention the name of the MP, but the reply was, well, you can give them a little quiet job in the last five years of the service in an office or a place where there's none. And I, and I just remember screaming at the TV, you've privatised all those little office jobs. Language, that officers language, do. just in case. <laughs> you've privatised all those jobs. So officers now are stuck at the coal face right the way up until they're 68 years old, uh, the, 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 the common retirement age of prison officer days. But that's just a little side. Let's move on. It's education. Yeah, anyway. I've, got, I've got an image actually there. I mean, it, it, that's that's the the top that a, a prisoner would have worn. Uh, who was a um, there we go a further education a mentor. mentor. And somebody and, and Polly again has just asked the question about how do you become a writer in residence and stuff like that. And, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, basically, I, if you, you you've got the qualifications and such like, you just literally write to a governor, I believe, and and ask the governor at the local level because I think it's controlled by local level governors who can decide whether somebody comes in a writer in residence and, and how long that may be for and what are their specific aims when they come in there, what is it about? It's all roughly about the same thing, of course, encouraging prisoners to express themselves and look at it, look at writing also as an artistic form uh, and, and it's certainly the benefit for them just to improve their skills at reading and writing, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna jump back well, at least 50, 60, 70 years, basically, back into in, into the Victorian times, uh, because education just didn't happen in the Victorian times. And we, and we hear a lot. Not now, in the same I, way. I know no. we have this conversation a lot, and people comment on a lot. And we, we love the different the different ideas and the different thought process and the different beliefs that people have about whether prison used to be better, mm. whether it's better now, the whole rehabilitation versus, yeah. versus incarceration kind of debate. Um, but it, in, 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 in the Victorian times, where we've seen, you know, the, the libraries and then and, and the education that people can do in the Victorian times, they would have been on the treadmill. Oh, absolutely. Well, that that was that was work. <laughs> perhaps it was. A, but there was no education in the Victorian times. Well, it perhaps was, they decided was that was their education. Yeah, absolutely. Get on there, get bored, and uh, do that for eight hours a day, and basically until you drop, and then you might learn. <laughs> That it's not the best way to go about your life yeah. so it may have been partly that as well but uh, education uh, prisons have changed over the years for obvious reasons the reality is we're a reflection of society yeah uh, you know you can't run a victorian system in a modern society we're just a reflection of society around us uh, uh, from that level so uh, yeah uh, education another thing that goes on in education too most of the prisons i've ever been in uh, is cook cooking and it's done through the education department. One of the things that we found in Shrewsbury, prisoners obviously like to come and cook. They're supplied with the goods. They cook the meals and they get to eat the things that they cook. And they really enjoy doing that. And they enjoy doing art as well. 
Uh, here we found there was a problem that prisoners were interested in doing art and doing cooking, but not so interested in doing maths and English. So the teachers set up the program and said, would you fancy doing a bit of cooking? Oh, I'd love to, love to miss, yeah. What about, yeah, yeah, I'll do that as well. Okay, then on Thursday morning, it's English and cooking in the afternoon. And next Tuesday, it's maths and it's art in the afternoon. So they couldn't do one without the other. So it was a bit of the carrot and the stick. If you want the good side of things, sometimes you've got to apply yourself to some of the more things that you'd rather avoid. Uh, we'll all choose to do what we're good at. Very rarely do we choose to do the things we struggle with. And uh, I, because why would you? You'd go, well, I can do that well, so I'll do that. But, yeah. I think that's really interesting because what, what, you, what you picked up there is the academic side of things is where prisoners wouldn't necessarily have, have, have gone to naturally. And I, I can, absolutely respond to that myself because I hated doing maths and English mm. and stuff like that. I'd far rather doing the practical side of things. Yeah. Didn't really like art that much, but technology no. no. and, and, and physical education and stuff like that. And I would imagine there's, I mean, it, it's, it's going to be a sweeping statement, this one, but I'll chuck it out there anyway, that actually there's going to be a, a larger percentage of prisoners who are exactly the same as that. They don't, don't do or haven't really done academics and, and gone through the academic yeah. process with English, maths and sciences yeah. and stuff like that and tend to probably go more to, yeah. the, to the other side of the, the, the arts yeah. and such, which is why they don't want to do it. Well, that, that, I'm, personally, I've always been a, a lifelong learning supporter right the mm -hmm. way to the very, very end. And one of the things about the better your education becomes, the better you're able to challenge the things that you're told by people and the better you are able to go and research that information you're told. We're in a world these days of social media. And if you read some of this stuff, people put out what are basically Basically only their opinions yeah. but they try to frame them like they're a fact <laughs> and many people pick that up because when they read this information on, on Facebook or wherever you're going to read this media stuff they tend to believe it without checking whether it's true because it fits in with their personal and emotional narrative it's what they think should be and somebody else is using that information they're using that ability to tell you things that are actually not true I see it all the time and I'm sure you do but the first thing I do is I go and do that research and I come back and go, well, that's not a fact. That's not true at all, is it? Um, so, yeah, the better an education is, the better people can read and write and understand. You can be able to look at people's when they're and going, hang on a sec. That's just that's just an opinion at the end of the day. Uh, and it have, might have any any validity. So all those things are useful for everyday use just for literally surviving in a world where we're full of misinformation now i truly are full of misinformation i love that i think that, i think that's so so key in in, in the world we're currently in and, mm. and and so many things are subjective and and science people people always look at science and go well the science is is proving that that's real yeah as i know science is about disproving things it's about going we know that's not true, true. we know yeah. that's not true it's about science is yeah. about eliminating that's right the the, yeah. the eliminating the errors science is leaving facts as science to is never about failure yeah <laughs> people always say it's a failure and i go it's not because they never went to the moon they, the very first rocket they, with the first rocket they built they never went to the moon and they didn't expect to get there yeah. with the first rocket so everything's a progression within science why doesn't that work let's find out what's wrong and then change it until yeah, we get but it, it right but, but yeah. it's, that, it's that concept that yeah. science isn't about proving that theory it's yeah. about disproving all the other yeah. theories to, to to go with it, it it's yeah, a, yeah it, yeah. Uh, anyway, we digress. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and other things that they run on in education, it can happen just outside here, is basically sometimes you can have these group discussions, uh, debates. Uh, I've been involved in a few of them myself, and they can be really, really good. As long as you set the ground rules properly for having a debate within a room, um, it, they can be really, really quite instructive and educational. And that's more about getting people sometimes to see other people's point of view. Uh, usually when we get passionate about something that we're doing or believing ourselves, we sort of shut off when other people have an opposing view to us because it doesn't fit in with us uh, at that level, rather than listening to it constructively and going, you know, I can sort of see what you say. You don't have to agree with anything just because um, you, they, they've said it differently to you. But it's uh, so, so debates can be very good about understanding that other people have different views in the world uh, and they may have a merit and unless you listen to see that, uh, and, and they always say, with a, you know, education to me is always having the right to change your mind. People should always have the right to change their mind. If you go through life and you realize that what you believe isn't right, you should have the right to change your mind without people saying, oh, well, you said that and you did this. Uh, because you do, in the light of experience and, and age, sometimes you realize what you believed when I was 20 isn't actually true anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I've always reserved the right to change my mind. Uh, and I think that's a really good place to be. 
and yeah. people shouldn't put you down. Well, you always said, yeah, I did, but I've learned something different. You, you've been watching my join Joel's. I know that I did. I did an actual video on this. I maybe, never watched maybe, Joel. Maybe, maybe two weeks ago, I did an actual video on this, saying that is is one of the things I was most proud of as a, as, as an entrepreneur, as a person, as I've as sort of grown and, and and adapted, is the um, is learning that I can change my mind and yeah, be absolutely. okay with that, and listening yeah. to other opinions and going actually. Yeah. Yeah. I've got that wrong and 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 when i really thought about that what and one of the things that sort of helped me get there as well is listening to you guys talk about first night officers and um the first uh, the the um, first night role is, is prisoners come in because and again how and i did some work with with an organization that was taking people who had far um uh, really right right-wing beliefs um who are very strong racists and they they were trying to take these people through through a journey of, of education and, and and getting them to understand that actually that's you know this is the belief yeah. again to change their opinions and we, we were meeting people that had been really really strong right wing fascists who now work heavily in, in embedded in, in into yeah. um, multi uh, cultural uh, uh, areas and yeah. such like that and it was they've had they've had to take such a journey and the change and all of that has come as, as, as yeah. education well, that's, that's a lovely statement you can see on that photograph yeah. there education as the practice of freedom the better the education the more sense of freedom you'll have because. It, it just works that way because I said you can find out information for yourself. You don't have to take what somebody else says at face value purely on the grounds that you don't have the skills or the knowledge to be able to, to challenge it. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, practice, education is the practice of freedom. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask you something in a second. Just before I do, Je Jess has put a question up. And Jess, I'm just going to ask you just to, uh, if you can, if you're still on, just to put a comment up to say why you think why you think that, why it would be harder for prisoners. And if you could put that up and I'll, I'll pose all of that to Officer Goodwin and he can, he can respond. Now, do you think there is a direct correlation between the level of education that prisoners get in prison and the reoffending rate in the sense of the more education you do, the more you learn, the less likely your reoffending is to be and therefore you rehabilitate and you come back to prison? <sighs> That's a really, really big and a very, very complex question because there are many people that come to prison You're numerous <laughs> times who are perfectly, uh, they're perfectly well educated, they understand the rights and wrongs, they understand the whole processes, and I've had many a good discussion with prisoners over the years about those kind of things, um, but they do say that if you look at the crime figures, um, the, biggest present, the biggest percentage of people that come to prison would be represented by what they call the lower social economic groups. Yeah. So it may not just be about education, but they're probably tied in together somewhere about access to um, sort of higher level education may be more difficult in the lower social economic groups, uh, and they may be much more sort of... Um, uh, uh, sort of peer pressure stuff going on in those groups. I, I, you know, I, I struggle with that question and I've got it off, you've given it to me off the top of my head, to be honest with you. Off the top of my head, how it, it just slips a note across like a barrister. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it, it's not so easy to, it, it, there's never a one reason, but there must be some true things because remember, good education allows people to move on in life yeah. after they leave school and it gives them a better job of finding that kind of work that employers are looking for at that educational level, yeah. It's because if you right miss it at that stage, it's very difficult to come back to. When you're in your 20s and you may find yourself in a low-skilled job that pays, and it's not the job for you, there's nothing wrong with them, um, non-skilled jobs in that sense. Low pay there's an issue with, but not those. <laughs> people sometimes are happy with that piece of work and that's brilliant as well. But there are people there that would like to move on and they struggle now in their 20s because they've got commitments, they've got rent or mortgages and families, and they can't really afford to go to the, 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 the um, sort of evening adult classes that are available to them. So they tend to get trapped in that place. Uh, so really it's about where they are at that point in time. So if they don't get a really good rounded education, and it is different possibly in the lower socioeconomic groups than it is. And, and the proof of that is in wealthy people send their children to private school. Yeah. Uh, because there's only 20 children in that classroom and not 40 like there is in the public system. And they get to go on abroad. They get to go on these lovely skiing holidays where parents can afford all those things. So that's an educational experience. Uh, and all, all the other things, the extra outside school activities that take place, they take place much more in private schools than they ever do in, in the public system and all that. So there is a balance between, you know, at, at the bottom end of the scale of economic level and at the higher level of people that have that education because they've got the money to pay for it. I, I think that's right. Yeah. I think you'll, we'll, 
we'll find a direct correlation between the type of crime that people from social economic backgrounds will commit. So from a lower social economic background, you're more likely to have the petty crimes, the thefts, the burglaries, probably potentially more drug and alcohol yeah. offences. And a higher, uh, and a higher so social economic, you're more likely to have the blue collar crime as they yeah. would do. So white collar crime. White, white collar crime, sorry, in terms of yeah. um, uh, uh, tax evasion. And, yeah. Um, I, I know yeah, I the know, big scams that go on for hundreds of thousands, if yeah. not millions of pounds. Well, I know Although somebody to exclude who, that with the wealthy, you exclude things like um, violence. Yeah. Because violence can be perpetrated from people from all walks of life, particularly when you consider murder. It isn't an exclusive thing to people of lower socioeconomic groups. Uh, it can happen at the higher levels. It's been proved time and time and time again. Classic examples might be people like Jeremy Bamber. Um, uh, you know, relatively wealthy, came out of a wealthy family, and uh, you know, he was convicted of killing his sister, I believe, um, and, and the children and parents as well, I believe, uh, all to take over the estate. Um, so, yeah, motivations are different for different things when it comes to murder and violent crimes. Yeah, uh, they're not based on economics in that sense. But. Okay, let, let's let's move. I, I love the journalists. Oh, we, we, take, we, we go. We go. Over. She's not. She's not come back yet. I'll just. I'll just give her. Well, a give minute. us a just, question anyway. Well, it's a really good one, but I want. To, I want. I'm really curious to get just to draw a little bit more from her as to the reasons why she thinks that because it, it, it's a bit of a statement. It's not incorrect, I wouldn't say, but it's a bit of a statement. I'm just curious about the the thought process behind that as she's posed it. And if I ask you now and you answer it, it will. I won't be able to get the thought process back. So I'll, I'll that. One uh, another thing. So obviously people can do education. We know they do education almost from well from a point of unable to read. So learning, you know, the yeah. ABCs, the one, two, threes, all the way through up to degree level yeah. um, and master's degrees in various different subjects and various different disciplines. But they also would do different types of learning. I've got a really good um, image here to put up, which is about uh, more about um, problem solving. Yes, as, as, a, as yeah. opposed to yeah, it's not, direct academic learning. It's not purely what they call sort of academic teaching with maths and English. It, it, sometimes it's learning through experience. It's yeah. learning through doing. Uh, and that's really good for some people that struggle. Uh, they can actually get somewhere. To, they can actually get the same education, but in a different way. Yes, we all learn in different ways. Some of us are very visual. Some are very practical. And some people are just very good in their own heads of being academic and understanding things without actually seeing practical demonstrations yet. So absolutely. There's all kinds of ways of learning. That's true of society generally, of course. But and this, yeah. this actually, I believe this 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 image we've we've put up is actually um, a group of, of employees inside a prison yeah. that are, are trying something before they roll it out with prisoners. Yes, which yeah. is which is why there's a, there's yeah. a bit of a mixed bag there yeah. that you can sort of see. But we do this, don't we, with our with our corporates? We have corporate groups come to both Shetland and to Shrewsbury, and we'll do. Um, some really interesting problem solving tasks. I think we've got one task where you have to put together an IKEA cabinet without the instructions yeah. um, and then yeah. things like that. Yeah, you, so. uh, you know, they always say education, wherever it's possible, should be fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's not always possible when you're doing probably very complicated maths equations, of course. Right. Um, yeah. But um, I, would, I would say it's a good job we've got bars on the windows because when you see them put together the IKEA yeah. cabinets, they want to try and throw them out the windows. Yeah, so yeah. It's, uh, but as far as employers coming into prison with education, we're going to leave that because we're going to talk about specifically about work and rehabilitation yeah. programs for prisoner, which is on a separate place to where actual education is. Uh, 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 you just you just jumped into Jess's question. Jess just literally had asked it. No, she's not responded, so I'll ask you. I'll put the question out there now. It's it's more of a statement, but saying it must be hard for prisoners getting jobs when they're out, because not many people would take them on. I was curious as to why her assumption is that not many people take them on. I don't think it's a wrong assumption, but no. it's interesting as to just because they've been to prison, why wouldn't they get employment? And because we know a number of prisoners, you know, a lot more it, than it, I do, who actually have just been in for very yeah. small crimes. And, and, and yeah. some it, it, it is difficult to because there isn't an application out there and not only does it not ask you about do your you education, yeah. it asks you about your previous criminal, yeah. uh, any previous criminal activities, yeah. right down to have you ever been cautioned by the police? Yeah. Uh, and not to answer those, it actually is an offence, honestly, is actually an offence in its own mm -hmm. right. Uh, and employers, I suppose, do make discriminatory decisions based yeah. on that but just on the information they get i've always said it's hard enough to get a job today without a criminal record let alone when you've got one 
although there are some extremely um, good programs running within the prison system. I'm not sure whether to touch on it now with your Timpsons or touch on uh, it later on no, when we come down it's to the difficult. We, work. we were originally going to do this session as education and work together, yeah. and we kind of felt we're nearly at 45 minutes. Well, they're sort minutes. of blended anyway. You they can't... are blended, but yeah. they, there's also a huge separation. So we talked about doing works next yeah. week, but I think we're going to talk about Christmas behind bars next yeah. week, aren't we? So we're going to, you won't, I say we. Yeah. You're going to talk about what, what Christmas looks like behind behind bars for, for prisoners, for prison officers, and for the families, because yeah. it doesn't just affect the people inside. It's, it's everybody but, that's but I, I spoke to many prisoners that come to prison, and, and they'll always say, oh, I've got a job and a get-up, boss. Yeah. No problems. Uh, and they have. Uh, they, they, I'm stealing lead off the church, boss. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the kind of job I'm thinking about. Uh, but they have. They'll either go, you know, they may be working on the building industry. It's quite yeah. traditional for many prisoners uh, because building industry can sort of have people in and let them go, have them well, in. And it's practical. Uh, it's uh, but, practical and there are many prisoners who come to, to, to prison. They're actually grafters. They're workers. They're not yeah. afraid of hard work. The fact that they're in prison, there's all kinds of reasons why they're in work. Uh, you don't technically come to work because you're on uh, prison because you're unemployed. Um, but they will, and they'll say, oh yeah, I'm going to work for my uncle, or I work for my dad, or I'm gonna, I've am i been promised my job when I get back. Absolutely. Not everybody. There are the bigger companies that may be a little bit more, I'm not sure we want you back, depending on the offence. If you're going to rob somebody of £200,000 in a company by fraud, you're not likely to struggle to get a job within a company where you may have access to things like their finances mm. or, or any systems that allow you that. So... Uh, yeah, but no, they're, they're, you know, I've known prisoners come to work, uh, come to prison, and they're not afraid of hard work. Um, they may not get the opportunities when they're out. That's part of the problem. I, I think that's it. We, we'll, we'll discuss that perhaps when we talk about how we manage. With, I think for works, yeah. When we talk about work and, and, and uh, outside agencies that come in to actually help prisoners look for employment mm -hmm. and actually sometimes employ them as well. And I think I think we're, we're building on so many sessions. I think I've just planned the next five sessions in my head as, as, as we're going. So next week we're going to do um, we're going to talk about Christmas. So and I can see Harriet's writing these down frantically now. So next, next week on Wednesday, we're going to talk about Christmas, what Christmas is like behind bars for the prisoners, what it's like for prison officers who obviously still will still have to be working. Um, what it's like for the families who are at home and yes. how, how prisoners can communicate yep. with their families yep. on Christmas Day, what they get to eat, what the routine is and such like that. And also the build up around Christmas and after Christmas because yep. a lot of people will be going off on the 23rd which I think is when we'll be doing this live next week. So a lot of people will be stopping on that day. I'm actually supposed to be at home that day, so I'll be coming in on the 23rd. Yeah. Um, I Harris, come in Harris, because Harris looking at me like, yeah, yeah. me too. Um, I come in, guys, because he keeps telling me to. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, you do it for, like being a prisoner, you really. do it for the love of it. Yeah. Um, the week after, I think we should actually follow on from that and potentially talk about what the that Christmas break is like for prisoners, mm -hmm. prison officers, and then families, but also talk about what happens in New Year's Eve. Because most people, obviously this year will be different with COVID, but most people will go out and they'll celebrate or they'll have friends around or they'll do something to celebrate um, New Year. And specifically... I know what happens in New Year's well, Eve. Well, don't go to it. I'll tell you when it gets to that point. Exactly. Yeah. And also yeah. we can look at... Um, everyone sets resolutions for New Year. I mean, I personally don't, but lots of people set resolutions. So it'll be, it'll be interesting again to see if, if there's a, a change, an actual change in the prison environment over that period of going to a new year, right boss, this is the year I'm gonna sort myself out, that kind of stuff. I think the week after that coming into January, we can start looking at work um, because we were looking specifically at, at doing a piece around work, weren't we? And talking about the difference between the UK and the US systems and how that connects and how work used to be and what it's like now. And I think beyond that, we've probably got an entire session on about release, about what happens when prisoners are released and, and finding jobs, but also what the, acclimatization is like and it might be going towards that stage Harriet where, we, where we're looking to get some ex-prisoners in to, to have a discussion because mm -hmm. let's be honest we I mean I don't know it Officer Goodman's got a huge amount of knowledge but again it's going to be that we're just going to start to miss that piece because none of us have had to do that release bit he gets to see them when they come back and they bring a friend yeah, um, we can have a little bit of a sort of a, a Jonathan Ross or a Graham Norton kind of show where we can have people invite sofa. people in. Okay, well, we'll get the new we studio set up in. over Christmas. We'll, then we'll I might get, get to sit stuff. down for a change. Well, we'll see. But you've spent... Well, they're all sitting down, guys. I'm always standing up. I'm the old one in the room. Really. You've spent right. years practicing, walking yeah. the landing, stood up in your, in, in your time. I've got leg braces on behind me, so I don't fall over <laughs> Um, so I, I, I think I'll just have a quick flick through the questions to see if there's any other questions that was there. Um, lots of really good comments about how much they've enjoyed it, which is great. So sure. thank you very much for that feedback. You're welcome, guys. Yeah, um, thanks. I'm just going to jump over to the Sheps and side, see if there's there. Oh, I love this one. 
I'd say putting together an IKEA cabinet is more of a punishment. <laughs> so I'm not, I think I'd probably agree with that. Okay, so that's that's us done until next week. Um, I'm actually about to jump in the car and head down to our prison at Shakhtar Malik for the next couple of days. Um, you're probably uh, you're, you're running tours this afternoon, aren't you? I am. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to be running tours, tours for the rest of this afternoon. week, and then I'm not sure. If some I think Mike's on next week. Do you mean Mick? Mick. Mick, yeah, yeah, Mike. yeah, Mike, Mick, yeah, um, the, uh, the other guy. Um, uh, but yeah, so, and then next week we'll be back and we will talk all about prisons and uh, Christmas. And hopefully some of you will be off work, so there'll be more people, but do absolutely think of any questions around that and then we will see you next week. Do you want to say goodbye, Officer Jim? Yeah, look forward to seeing you next week, guys, and stay safe, stay safe.